Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, um, I'd like to continue. Um, <clears throat> The second part is going to be a little bit more far afield uh, from Worldwide Telescope and Layerscape. I want to talk about another one of our technologies, uh, briefly called Distribution Modeler. Uh, and that's going to, I'm, I'm introducing it for a couple of reasons. One of them is that it'll uh, produce a data set that I'll then view in Worldwide Telescope. Um, but it's kind of a long ways to go to go from Distribution Modeler to a visualization. Um, but in so doing, I hope to make the point that, again, you don't need to have geospatial data. You don't need to have latitudes and longitudes in order to use the Layerscape visualization engine uh, to look at and try and make sense of what's going on with your data. Uh, and then the second point that I want to do is, or the re second reason I'm bringing up distribution modeler is because I think it, it connects back to what I started talking about at the beginning about the progression from thinking about science, thinking about environmental science, to data, to information, to models, and then to predictions, and then to services. Uh, and again, that's sort of in preparation for the second speaker who will be here this afternoon after lunch. Um, before I continued, somebody uh, asked me during the break about doing analysis and Distribution Modeler is really uh, going to be a technology about uh, analysis. But is Worldwide Telescope something that you can think about using for analysis? And I want to emphatically state that the answer is no. Uh, if you want to uh, add numbers together, if you want to uh, take a Fourier transform of a spectrum, if you want to do the kind of thinking about data that you can do even, for example, in the Excel spreadsheet, Worldwide Telescope is not the technology, and it's not the place to do that kind of stuff. Worldwide Telescope doesn't know about carbon. It doesn't know about climate or oxygen or tides or water or anything like that. It doesn't even know about planets. What it knows about is pixels. And, um, well, it's got some built-in interface to allow you to explore these, these uh, important environments. Uh, but... The way to think about Worldwide Telescope is really as connected to a second application. So this is a, a, a connection uh, picture of how things work. If you think about Worldwide Telescope is just ready and waiting to draw pixels of your, uh, a pixel representation of your data, then you need a second application that has the intelligence that does understand dissolved oxygen or carbon dioxide or something like that. And then that will talk to Worldwide Telescope. And you can either talk to Worldwide Telescope by means of creating files and then importing them, or you can talk to Worldwide Telescope through something called an API, which is short for Applications Programming Interface. And that, what that means is if you happen to be a computer programmer and you have um, just a, a sort of beginning level skill, you learn how to make print statements. Print statements are typically write text like hello world to a screen somewhere, but you can also print onto these things called ports. And I, I don't work with this very much, so I'm just kind of giving you a layman's picture of it. But if you can generate a print statement that happens to be very long and has a bunch of data in it, then you can print that to Worldwide Telescope. And it sits there and listens on its API channel. And it listens for that print statement. When, you, when it hears the print statement, it takes in all the stuff that you said, and it tries to render that as data. So at the very last thing I'll do today is I will show a developer's view of how to generate these print statements and what that ends up looking like. If you're not a programmer, then A, maybe it's kind of culturally interesting uh, and you can just sort of doze off or whatever. Uh, or B, you could say, well, you know, that doesn't actually look too difficult. Uh, maybe this is something I could explore. And that's, that certainly would be a, a great outcome for us. We would love it for more people to sort of get engaged in programming and writing computer programs uh, because it's uh, enjoyable, it's kind of rewarding, it's fun to do, and uh, it, it gives you a certain measure of control over the technology uh, that it enables you to sort of pursue the things that you can imagine doing. So Worldwide Telescope is not an analytical tool, it's a pixel drawing tool, and you want to have your intelligence sitting in another application, 
And I've already given an example of a data application that has that sort of intelligence, and that example was, was the Excel spreadsheet. So the Excel spreadsheet by itself doesn't really know how to talk to Worldwide Telescope, but that's okay because you can install the Worldwide Telescope add-in for Excel, and that does know how to talk to Worldwide Telescope. That's a bunch of programming code that talks to the Worldwide Telescope interface. But there's a quick way of doing things also, and that's called cut and paste. And I showed that earlier when I cut data from Worldwide Telescope and I pasted it here into, uh, into Excel. So I'd like to go in the other direction now and cut and paste from here into Worldwide Telescope. So I have, um, this is the wrong data file. Let me go to the right data file. I don't have the right data file. OK, I better regenerate the data file. So let's go back to Worldwide Telescope. I'll do my climate demo. This time I'm going to keep going past where I want to be. I'm going to do that fetch climate demo so that'll sort of reemphasize that fetch climate is just sitting there waiting for somebody to come along and, and ask it for data. So here I am in Excel. I go to Worldwide Telescope ribbon. I go to the services, and there's the fetch climate demo. If everything goes according to plan, this is now going to talk to Worldwide Telescope and get a latitude and longitude at the east side of the Himalayas. It's going to go to the computer in Cambridge, and it's going to get a block of data, precipitation, and surface temperature. It's going to bring that back into a table in Excel, and it's going to try and draw that uh, data in Worldwide Telescope. So telescope to Cambridge and fetch climate, and then back to telescope again, all from this little application. Dramatic pause. I think we're about halfway there. Why would works manifest a question? Certainly. Uh, uh, one of the problems with something happening with the analytical and the couple of data feedback is that uh, it's Yeah, let's get the microphone. Well, uh, let me start again. One of the problems of not having the analytical engine coupled to the database engine is that sometimes I need a, a whole bunch of set of data in order to calculate one value and use only that value. For instance, uh, if, I, if I'm doing a low pass band filter, I have the raw data and I need to uh, get a window of data that will revert to only one point. Uh, imagine a, a, a sine curve. Uh, if I get that from a sensor, the sine curve will be uh, very ir irregular. So I, I, want, I would like to pass a low, low pass band filter, and it would make, would make a nice regular wave. In order to do th that, I have to get a, a moving window over the, the signal, calculate the, uh, the value of each new point, and uh, use this point instead. So uh, if I can couple the engine to the database, I, I can do it in a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. uh, how would I use that with Worldwide Telescope? So you're talking about uh, doing the low-pass filter on a signal. Yes. And as you, as you do that, your signal is evolving. Well, it may evolve or it may be just a, a large signal. So I, I would uh, make a low-pass band on a, on a small part at each time. I'll, I'll move. My, my, the signal window would, would be a temporal uh, right. feedback. So if you're talking about having a large data set and you're sort of operating locally on a piece of it at a time, right, then you're right. If you had that inside your visualization engine, you could sort of see that changing as you go. right. But what you can also do is you can have, as a developer, you can, boy, this really needs to reboot. Open Worldwide Telescope and try again. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. It's not working. So you can talk to Worldwide Telescope by means of that API that I was describing, and you can simply send over pieces of data as you go. But what, what I was describing was something that's a little bit more diff a little different, which is that it's difficult to put that analytical low-pass filter machinery inside the Worldwide Telescope application itself. And the reason for that is because 
we would have to sort of choose a particular type of analysis, let's say it was a low-pass filter, mm -hmm. and then we would have to sort of figure out how to implement that, and then we would, somebody would come along and say, well, I don't want that low-pass filter, I want the different one, and then really what you want to do is use R, or you want to use MATLAB or something like that. So if you decouple them, then you're sort of keeping, the, the, you're trying to minimize the simplicity of each application. So, it, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try this one more time, and if, if we're uh, dead in the water, we're dead in the water, and we'll just have to reboot. Oh, except I went to the wrong place. Duck on it. It's going to be very boring data. All right, well, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so that worked. And now just to show what I'm doing, so that's no, uh, I'm again, I've gone over to the Himalayas here. I've gone to Worldwide Telescope, Services, Fetch Climate Demo, and we'll let it run again. Um, by default, Worldwide Telescope comes up at zero latitude, zero longitude, which is out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa, and so that data is less interesting, and I wanted to have slightly more interesting data, so we'll take a moment to rerun the Fetch Climate call. I think we're doing that now. could threaten to go on to something else and maybe it would respond to that. Okay, well, let's go on to something else and we'll see if we can come back to this. It'll be like a cooking show. So I've mentioned several times distribution modeler and I'm going to um, tempt fate and try and do a demonstration here. Yes, that's good. So, just for fun here. No, that still hasn't come through. Okay. It worked. Okay, hallelujah. So I've uh, run the fetch climate demo, and I've generated this data um, just for technical reasons. It's not as beautiful as I'd like, but it nevertheless does illustrate that there's more rain on the south side of the Himalayas and less as you go over up, up into the Himalayas and, and where it gets also colder, so the colors are colder. Uh, I'm going to go back to Excel and just demonstrate one more time uh, messing around with Excel and getting a, uh, a data set back into Worldwide Telescope. So thematically what we're doing right now is how do I get data into Worldwide Telescope? And I have this fetch climate block of data here which has two columns, min la and, min and max la, which are latitudes for a particular block in that block of cells I was just showing. So I'm going to create a column called lat and I'm going to have its value be equal to 
for n, a2 plus b2 divided by 2. And I'm going to create a column called long for longitude. And I'm going to give that a value equal to C2 plus D2 divided by 2. Okay, so a cool Excel trick is to be able to take the beginning of a column of data that's not filled out and say, okay, do the same thing all the way down. You grab on this little thing here and you double click on it and it fills it out. So I've just averaged these two latitude values and these two longitude values to make this table over here. And then there's altitudes, which are, of course, related to the annual precipitation, and color, which is built out of the temperature. So I have four columns of data here, and I'd like to just paste that into Worldwide Telescope. So I'm going to select all four columns. Whoops. Let's try that again. Like that. I'm simply going to say copy. So uh, my point here, with my, my goal here was to copy and paste from here into Worldwide Telescope, from Excel into Worldwide Telescope. So I'm going to paste. Except this time the data doesn't just fly in. Instead it brings up this wizard here and it says, okay, you're trying to paste in some data. That's great. Let's call that a new layer and we'll give it a name. So we'll call it HIM for Himalayas. And then we'll work our way through this little wizard. Now, I had a column called lat and another one called lawn, and Worldwide Telescope is guessing that those are latitude and longitude, and I have no problems with that. And the same thing with altitude, and it happens to be in meters. So I can customize my data paste process here, but as it happens, those are fine. And then I have a scale factor here, and I'm going to drop that down and make it a little bit lower so that uh, it's not too bright. And my markers are going to be Gaussians. My color is my color column. So everything's looking good, and I'm going to finish. So there, I pasted a new layer. It's called him. But I've also got two fetch climate layers here. And I'm going to turn them both off. So my him data is down in here somewhere. It's a bunch of little dots, but I can't really see them. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make that more visible and sort of show them as columns. And so I'm going to go back to my him layer here, and I'm going to right-click on that. And I notice that uh, right-clicking is sort of uh, my standard operating procedure in Worldwide Telescope. Right-clicking gives me these menus where I can do all kinds of stuff. So if I right-click on that layer and I get down to properties, that's going to bring up that wizard again as a bunch of tabs. And now I can go in and I can modify how my data is viewed. And in particular, in the markers column here, we chose Gaussian, which are these little fuzzy dots. And instead, I'd like to make my data be column data, because I think that'll look better. OK. So I'm done, and my data, you didn't see it, but it sort of grew in like this. And there's my data. So my data has been rendered as a bunch of little squares that are all next to each other. And it's sort of semi-transparent so that I can see through it and I can see the terrain underneath. And that's my Himalaya. If I right-click on it, notice I right-click, and I change the opacity, I can sort of fade it out and dissolve it away, too. And that uh, can be useful in seeing the underlying surface features. I can also fly through my data. OK. All right, so that's fine. Um, but there has to be a purpose for building the Excel add-in for Worldwide Telescope. And so what I'd like to do now is do exactly what I just did, but I'll do that using the Excel add-in. So again, we have this ribbon here. We have all this data. And I'm just going to send over these four columns. So I've selected those four columns. Hang on a second. OK. And I have a button up here called Visualize Selection. So let me just do this first.
We still going? Okay, we're back in business. Thankfully. Okay, one more time with feeling. Okay. So again, I'm going to go through my process of visualizing my data. I say visualize selection and it brings up that wizard, except this time the wizard is in Excel. And for reasons of taking care, I'm going to drop the scale factor down. And again, I have, um, this is not as easy as it looks. Okay, I have four columns that I've selected, altitude, color, lat, and long. And it takes those four columns and it makes guesses as to what the column name should be assigned to in Worldwide Telescope. So here's an assignment of altitude to altitude. I could change the altitude to be distance or any of these other attributes, but altitude happens to be correct. So I'm happy with my assignment here. And now I'm going to say, let me widen this out a little bit. I'm going to say view in Worldwide Telescope. So let's go to Worldwide Telescope and sort of turn off our visualization. So him, him is off and Fetch Climate 2 is gone. And back here we can click on view. Okay, so the steps were as follows. I generated some data. Um, I selected that data and clicked on this Visualize Selection button up here. And then it sort of did the wizard work here. And now that finally there's a View in Worldwide Telescope button down here to send the data to Worldwide Telescope. And did it show up? I don't see it. Where did it call it? Yeah, I called it Fetch Climate 2. This is a residual name. OK. So there's our data here. And again, I can go to Properties. And I can go to Markers. And I can change it from Gaussian to be columns again. And the data grows up into place. Oops. And we're all done. OK. So that was, that was rather belabored. I apologize for the, for the slow pace here. But uh, again, I'm just trying to sort of demonstrate that it's fairly straightforward to use this technology to get a, a column or data column data into a worldwide telescope. And the same thing applies to irregularly spaced data. There's no, there's no rule that says this data has to be nice and gridded like this. It can be all over the place. So with that, I'd like to turn to um, Fetch Climate. No, sorry, not to Fetch Climate, to Distribution Modeler, and do a quick demonstration of how that works. Whoops. So Distribution Modeler is a website. You'll notice this is a browser. And it works on uh, data sets that contain observations about something that's going on out in the world. And so the first thing we'll do is we'll import a data set. So now I'm to totally away from Worldwide Telescope. This has nothing to do with Layerscape right now. This is entirely about a system for uh, conceptualizing a model and then um, carrying out your ideas against some data that you happen to have. So earlier I mentioned that I had some data. I'll import that data now. And what we're going to do is we're going to build something that resembles a workflow. Um, so this would be a, sort of a, a workflow uh, system, if you like. And workflow simply means I have a whole bunch of tasks that I want to do in some sequence. So I want to set up the machinery to do that. And then we'll sort of say go, and it will f the data will flow through the machinery. Uh, but the nice thing about Distribution Modeler is the machinery that's put in place happens to be very sophisticated stuff that's related to ecological analysis and statistical analysis. So again, I'm working from a browser, and I have this interface here. I'm going to select my data file, which is sitting on my SkyDrive, and it's called Gauss Data. So now I've created an action here, which is read in a data file. And once it's configured, I can run it. And so it runs, and sure enough, it creates a data file. So let's take a look at the data file. The data file appears to be a series of columns. which I cannot for the life of me see. Hang on a sec. I'm going to try 
duplicating my screen so I can have a chance of seeing what I'm doing and working more efficiently. Okay. Is that going to work? Oh, no, it doesn't work because for some reason it's blanked out my other screen, huh? Okay, let's give up on that idea. Okay, difficult to see, but up here you can see that there's a column called beer and a column called pirates. And over here somewhere there's another column called joy. So we have our data. And what I'd like to do then is proceed through this interface to create a model of the relationship between beer pirates and joy, and then we'll see if the system can actually solve for the parameters uh, per what I showed at the beginning of my talk. So first thing I want to know is what does my workflow look like so far? Well, I happen to be on the data page, but it's got provenance. Hmm. I don't know if this is going to recalcitrant and maybe I'm just gonna have to give up on it okay to charge Drew for pre-testing this. Okay, one more time. I'm going to import a file. I'm going to browse that file. I'm going to go to my SkyDrive. I'm going to go to Distribution Modeler. I'm going to get gauss.data, gauss data. I'm going to run the module. I'm going to get the data file. It looks beautiful. And then I'm going to say, what does my workflow look like so far? Aha. Fantastic. We have a round thing, which is an action, and a square thing, which is an object. So we have imported the file, and there's the file. I can go back to the file and look at it. And then I want to say, what else do I want to do? Well, I, my whole spiel here has been talking about building a model. So let's build a model. I want to estimate the parameters. So I have the model in my head that it's like a bell curve, that joy is a function of beer, and I have a bell curve, joy is a function of pirates. So now I want to go and actually explore that by creating a couple of bell curves. So I'm going to run this module here. So you'll notice that this provenance connects my data to the data loader, and the use in new is everything that I could do from here. So one of the things I could do from here is I could make a chart. So I'm going to, before I go on and explore my model, I'm going to make a chart of my two types of source data, my environmental data, which is beer and pirates, and my observed data, which is joy. So I'm going to make a... Um, well, it's already selected my, my Gauss data as my source. I'm going to make a pin description or a pin plot. So my need to get beer on the x-axis, pirates on the y-axis, and the color is going to be joy. OK. Interesting. Let's hide the legend. OK, so sure enough, we have a sort of a sweet spot for beer and a sweet spot for pirates. And the joy is at the maximum there. So everything looks good. So now, I've, of course, created a chart from my data. So let's go back. So let's go on to look at the chart. Hang on a second. OK, so there's my entire workflow so far. 
This is a, a constraint because the, the screen is so narrow here, so I'm going to have to sort of wiggle it back and forth like that. But you can see that we loaded the file, and then we put that into a chart maker, and there's our chart. And there's our chart. It comes up, it shows us our stuff. And again, we'll click provenance to go back to the workflow. And now we'll go back to our data, and we'll go and do the model estimation business. So this module called Estimate Parameters has both environmental data, which is beer and pirates, and it also has distribution data, which is joy. And finally, it needs a model. So this is where we're going to go about describing those bell curves. So I clicked on the model generator, and now we're in a new module that creates a model. OK, now this is ecologists who built this, so they like to think in terms of species. So I'll imagine that what I was observing was a species which is called joy. She says, yeah, you have joy, so that's good. I'm going to add that species. It's the only species we're going to model right now. I could model frogs and ostriches and emus and stuff like that. But I'm just going to model joy, because that's the only data that I have. Joy is measured as a real number. And it's uh, described in my model in terms of two niches. One of them is beer, and the other one's pirates. So I'm going to start, start typing beer here. It notices that I have a beer column. So it's looking at my source data and suggesting what I could be possibly talking about. So I now added beer. This is my beer model. And then I'm going to say, well, my beer model isn't a non-response. It's a bell curve or, or normal distribution or Gaussian response. So here's a little Gaussian curve. So I'm actually putting my model together as I'm speaking here. And then I say, well, there's another thing in my model, which is that joy is also dependent upon pirates. And so I say, add that. So here's the pa page that deals with my pirates. My pirates need a model. OK? So my pirates is also going to be a Gaussian response or a bell curve. So now I have a beer bell curve and a pirates bell curve. So everything is looking great. This is my model. It describes joy in relationship to beer and pirates. And then I want to say, great, let's go back to my workflow. So my model that I just built here is feeding into my parameter estimator, which also has beer and pirates and joy. And it has a run button. So now I can hit run, and that's going to go off and calculate an end result. And that end result I went, sort of went away too quickly. OK, so let's do this, metadata. Ugh. Sorry, everything is squished together. If this whole thing crashes, I'm going to be very disappointed. Yep, crashed. OK, well, that's a data point for those guys. Let's try and do this. All right, not to worry. Hmm. Not to worry too much.
Okay. So I'm getting um, carpal tunnel from this thing. Um, the The workflow window here, I can zoom out on it. Um, again, we're limited by two things. There's a, a bandwidth issue on the, the, the internet connection, and then there's a screen width issue here. So I apologize. Um, these are sort of things that you can't anticipate. But what we've got here, finally, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So I reloaded this entire workflow from a pre-existing zip archive. So what we had done so f sort of to begin with was we'd created a, uh, imported a data file and then created a model and put that into a parameter estimator and got a result. So the rest of this stuff here is kind of working with that result to do a prediction. And the prediction is um, the kind of thing that I was talking about in the beginning where you want to uh, predict the results of a model that you have a high confidence in. And so, We do that, we get to this provenance, and then we make a chart out of the results. Oh, let's see, we want to go to the provenance again. And there's that chart. Nope, that's not it. That's the chart. OK, let me see if I can narrate this through what happened to try and make sense out of this, because I realize this is a, it's kind of a rocky presentation. So at the very beginning, we had a data file that described the distribution of pirates and beer and then joy as a, as a consequence of that, which I said was sort of peaked along the beer axis and peaked along the pirate axis. And what we did was we brought that into this system, this distribution modeler, and we um, created a model for that where the distribution works is and, and then the distribution modeler solved for the parameters that best fit that model and then of course we can use that to make a prediction about given a certain amount of beer and a certain amount of pirates uh, what's the end result look like and so this is sort of supposed to be a recreation of our source data and this is the simplest uh, initial approach to using distribution modeler and so then I can describe to you a more complicated or more sophisticated use of distribution modeler, and then that'll, that'll sort of end this part of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to go back to my provenance chart here and say there's a multi-view at the very end. And the multi-view is both my source data here and then my prediction data, and, and you know, lo and behold, they match each other very nicely, and so that's great. Okay, so let me describe to you the more important purpose of this system as a predictive system, okay? So let's suppose that you have a, dist and Drew will probably do this, suppose that you have a distribution of, um, or a bunch of observations of wheat growing across the world, okay? So you go outside the door here and you try and grow wheat and it doesn't do very well because it's too warm and it's too rainy. You go to somewhere in, in Kansas in the United States and you try and grow some wheat and it does great because of the uh, a combination of how much rainfall there is and what the annual temperatures are like. Wheat grows really well. You go up to Fairbanks, Alaska and you try and grow wheat, unless you're inside of a greenhouse, the wheat's not going to do very well. So you go around the world and you make these observations, latitude, longitude, and how much wheat is growing, and that's all you know. Latitude, longitude, and how, much, how, and how well the wheat would grow there. Okay? don't know anything else. But you have this idea that how well wheat grows is related to the precipitation and the temperature. So you go into distribution modeler here and you say, okay, here's my latitude, here's my longitude, and here's how much wheat grows. Tell me something. And distribution modeler says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I don't have anything to go on here. All you have is observations. You don't have any background environmental data. And you say, ah, of course, I forgot my environmental data. What I need is climate data. I need climate data that matches the latitudes and longitudes where my observations are. Then you think, oh yeah, that's right. I could just go use fetch climate. So one of the buttons here, let's see if I go back to home. One of the buttons here happens to be fetch climate. So I click on this and it creates a little fetch climate module 
and I say, hey, fetch climate module, go to these latitudes and longitudes that are in my wheat data and find out what the climate is like there. And so that goes to fetch climate and it pulls that data back. And now we have data for annual precipitation and surface temperature. And then we have this sort of new data set that's got not only the observation of the wheat, but also the environmental data about what the temperature is and what the precip is. From there, we can go through the same process where we build a little model that says that I think that there's a peak temperature and a peak uh, precipitation for growing wheat. And just like our beer pirates joy, you can have distribution modeler solve for that and come up with an ideal environmental conditions for growing wheat. And you can, instead of plotting that on an XY chart, you can actually bring up a map of the world and it will show you that on here. So that since the map of the world is distributed in this funny way with continents and oceans and temperature and mountains and stuff like that, you just see where the wheat grows well. It grows really well, for example, in, in like northern Europe. Okay, so you say, ah, there we go. We fit a model to our data in terms of the background climate information. Now let's go ahead and do some predicting. Okay, so we can go back to fetch climate and say, what's it supposed to be like on the Earth 20 years from now? And fetch climate says, well, I happen to have a model run from a climate model that goes 20 years into the future. So here's what it's going to be like in 20 years. And then you can say through this distribution model or workflow, okay, great. In 20 years, where is a good place to grow wheat? So what you're doing is you're taking a climate model and you're using that in a predictive way based on your solution for the optimal conditions for growing wheat. So if you think about that, and think about us as a sort of a global community, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of questions and a lot, a lot, a lot of economic inertia behind questions like this. So you could actually start making decisions about how you're gonna manage your resources based on this future trend. This might not be a good time to plan on it getting colder, for example, where you live and switch to a colder weather crop. You might wanna to switch to a warmer weather crop if the global temperature is gonna keep on increasing. So that was a sort of a big, heavy conclusion of a, a, a kind of a rusty, uh, bumpy demonstration here. But hopefully that sort of gives you a flavor of the kind of stuff that we're working on behind Worldwide with Telescope as a, as a sort of a visual, visualization engine. We're also getting into things like analytics and into other aspects of technology in service of problem solving. Okay. So with that, um, I had... Uh, I did have a worldwide telescope kind of demo of some of this stuff. Let's see if I can find my cursor. And we'll see if that, we can get that to go. So I'll put fetch climate away. Okay, so I'm back to worldwide telescope. And I would like to add a reference frame. I'll just call it DM for distribution modeler. And that reference frame is simply a little XYZ coordinate system that's sitting down here at zero degrees latitude, zero degrees longitude. And I'll bring in over the top of that Excel once more. And these are some parameters. So each line here can represent, um, sorry, let me look at a more usable version of this. Each line here can represent a moment in time So as I've been doing in this morning's presentations, I'm going to select, select a block of data here. And this block of data, ugh, I must battle with my scroll bar again. Ah, I think I got it. Okay, this block of data has a bunch of data headers that don't particularly mean anything. L hood, M0, beta, uh, GPH, G-depth, GMOS, and then color and date, those sort of make sense. But what I'm saying here is that I have a series of parameters uh, that I'm interested in exploring. And I'll explain what those parameters are in a second. But just because I'm impatient, I'm going to copy and paste this data into Worldwide Telescope. And we'll hope that that uh, works out. Okay, so I have my little reference frame here called DM. I'm going to paste my data. It's going to be XYZ data, so I'm going to say it's a rectangular coordinate system. 
And now I have three axes to choose from. So my x-axis, I'll make beta, whatever that is. My y-axis, I'll make GPH, whatever that is. My z-axis, I'll make um, GMOS. Next. Okay, scale factor, I'm going to make that very small. Next. Gaussian dots is okay. Color is color. Next. Time is date. Next. Okay, I think we're done. So if this worked, then we have a data set to explore. And sure enough, down here is the data set. But it's a little bit faint, so I'm going to back away. Right click, open up the properties, scale factor, and make it a little bit brighter. Let's see, that's good. Okay. So what have we done? Uh, I'm going to describe what distribution modeler does in a statistical way. It says, I have a model that relates environmental data to observational data, and that model has some parameters. So for example, where is my bell curve centered? How high is my bell curve? And so forth. And however many parameters there are in the model, that's going to sort of generate an n-dimensional space, and then I want to find the place in that n-dimensional space that's the best fit. Okay? So what you do is you go off into that n-dimensional space and you calculate, if the parameters were right here, then how good would my fit be? And you say, oh, they're sort of okay. Now I'm going to take a random jump over to the side and I'm going to do it again. And if I did better, then I'm going to keep going this way and keep going this way until I start doing worse. So it's like a big game of hot and cold. And you wander around in this space until you reach a point where you can't do any better. You say, I found the spot in my parameter space where things are absolutely the best for my model, and this is the best fit right here, but you're not happy because you're not sure about how certain you are right now. So you say, okay, so I'm going to stay here for a while, but I'm just going to move a little bit, and I'm going to measure how much my fitness and my goodness of my model changes as I sort of vibrate around just in this local area. And every once in a while, I'll step away again and make sure, okay, no, everything's supposed to be right, right back here, and then I'll vibrate around for a while. So you do that for a while, and at the end of that whole process, you say, okay, this right here is the best place for solving my n-dimensional parameter model, but it's got a certain amount of, there's some uncertainty. So I also know that, you know, within these sort of two feet is really where the solution has to be, and the solution's not on the other side of the room over there. I'm really very confident about that. So this is called Bayesian analysis, or uh, Bayesian inference, or Bayesian statistics, and we have a picture of it in Worldwide Telescope here. Um, and what it means is that, as we went through our data set, each one of those rows was another attempt at finding the right parameters to fit. And this is a picture of wandering around in that space. So we started off doing the purple stuff. Let's get rid of all the stuff around the edges. So we started wandering off in the purple stuff here. And eventually, we sort of found the right place in the space, which is down here in the yellow and the red and the white. So, and I can prove that. Um, that's w sort of our destination point, um, besides waving my arms. I can prove that by going back to our pasted layer here and making it a time series layer, because I stuck time one time on each of those rows, and the very first row had the first time, and the very last row had the last time. And so if I make this a time series by checking this box here, then hopefully, oh, you know what? It's going to be hard to see because of all the light issues. So I'm going to... I'm going to take a chance here and make this much brighter. Um, I, I say take a chance because there's a little idiosyncrasy that if you make things too bright, you can crash your display driver, and then you have to reboot your machine and so forth. So let's see how that looks. Okay, so that's maybe a little bit too bright. Let's try that. Okay, so I'm going to angle myself a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the beginning of time. The beginning of my time sequence here. Uh, I can't see my data anymore. <sighs> okay, there's my data. 
So at the beginning, I'm wandering around in parameter space here all over the place. That's the purple stuff. And then it starts to settle down, and it settles down, and finally it augers into this yellow part, and then the sort of, oh, walks away, and it walks back, and it walks away, and it walks back, and it walks away, and walks back. And it's getting more and more confident, and finally it gets super duper confident, and it kind of zooms down into this, this particular, I'm zooming down right now, I'm not actually moving the time slider. And it, it ends up right here. So hooray, we've come to the end of our uh, distribution model or process. So that took like uh, you know, 10,000 steps, and it shows the walk that we're taking through our parameter space. Okay? Um, so that's, that's the end of that part of what I wanted to talk about. Um, there's two more things that I wanted to do today, and then we'll be all done here. Um, the first one is I wanted to actually publish some data to show what that looks like. So I'll tell you what. Let's back up to the beginning of what we were doing. I have to find my data again. I'm going to make this even brighter. Okay. And I'm going to create a tour. So back at the beginning when we started up Worldwide Telescope, we were hitting play and right-clicking and saying Presume, resume from here. So now let's actually make a tour. So I'm going to create a tour. It's going to be called LATAM. That's all I need to say. And now we have a tour editor up here. And this is my way of telling a story about this data. Good, I have 34 minutes left. So first, I'm going to back away on the Earth and say, OK, this is going to be my initial shot of my tour. So I'm going to add a new slide. And it does a little thumbnail capture here. And that slide is on its left ear, which is the beginning point of the slide. And then I want that slide to zoom down to my data. So I'm going to go down here until I can see that purple, initial purple dot. And I'll right click and say, set end camera position. So now I have a 10-second slide that starts from where we started and ends up here. I'm just going to save that. So save it as the LATAM tour. Save. And here we are. OK, not very interesting because we need to do some time playing forward in time. So let's add a new slide, which will pick up where the old one left off. And let's play forward in time a little bit. So, and at the end of the slide, I'm going to move my perspective to be down here and looking at that. OK, that's where I want the slide to end. So I'll say set end slide position again. Set end camera position. I'll make a new slide. And it'll pick up where we left off. And it'll go all the way to the end. We'll say set end camera position. And then I'm going to create another slide that just sits there quietly and does nothing. So now we have a four slide tour. I'll click on save. And let's see what the tour is going to look like. It's going to take 40 seconds to play. So for the first 10 seconds, because every slide is 10 seconds by default, for the first 10 seconds, we zoom down to our data, which is that purple stuff. And then it goes dee 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 for 10 seconds, and then it does d delete delete for 10 more seconds, and then for 10 more seconds, and then it's done. OK. So th that's not going to win an Academy Award or anything, but uh, at least it serves the purpose of being a tour that we created. And then, of course, we can add on to this. And I'll just do one more thing before we move on to publishing it. So I'm going to. Um, Go back to the first slide here. And I'm going to insert some text. And this happens to be Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So I'll call it MCMC Solution DLD. Save. So that's going to be part of the uh, 
slide now, but just to make sure, I'm going to say set start camera position. And I'm going to make this an animated piece of text. So I'm going to move it down here and say set end camera position. And then I'll save it. And I'll play it just to make sure it does what I think it's supposed to do. Well, it did the opposite of what I asked it to do, but this is weird. Huh. I guess I added a new slide and it went backwards. Anyway, it's probably some kind of strange behavior, but it's doing approximately what I wanted it to do, and I can go back and mess around with it some more. But more to the point, I've got my um, end result done, which is this file. Documents. Okay. So there's that file that we just generated. It's 300 kilobytes, which is mostly data, plus the cinematography. And I want to publish that to the Layerscape website, which is, like I say, acts as a sort of a um, sharing and collaboration website. It's sort of like YouTube, because you're publishing movies, but the movies are worldwide telescope movies. Um, so I'm going to go over here. And uh, maybe it's down here. Oh, there it is. OK, go back to the Layerscape website. Uh, I have a Windows Live ID, so that allows me to publish. It logged me in automatically. And I'm going to click on the Publish button. So this takes me to a publication page. And all I need to do is browse to my document LATAM, say Open, and it'll load it up. And I can then start uh, providing details about this publication. I can just click Publish right now, and it'll publish it. Um, but just for fun, I will show you the publication details that I can add if I feel like it. I can describe the data. Deedle. I could put my name. And I can give Drew credit because Drew did the work of building Distribution Modeler. I can create a thumbnail and put it in here. I can put some tags to make it more searchable. I can add other data files. For example, I could attach the Excel data file that I used to generate this and so forth. So there's a lot of machinery here for publishing um, stuff that's associated with your main content. But since I'm trying to be uh, time efficient here, I'll simply say, OK, that's pretty much everything I needed to do. I'll click Publish. And the website will then create a dedicated page to this content. And if I click on this link and copy that link, then I can go over to my tutorial page here. Well, I'm not logged in. I can edit this page and paste that link in here. And then you can just click on the link, and you can go get that tour. So that's the basic idea of Layerscape, is to uh, facilitate people to, who are, who've gone through the process of learning how to use Worldwide Telescope to then publish content here. You don't have to publish tours. You could publish layers. You can publish Excel files. You can publish JPEGs, anything you like, links. Uh, there's no restriction. You just have to have a Windows Live ID to play along. And then there's also the ability to create a community or a group and then to control uh, permission and access to that. So this website, which is powered by uh, Windows Azure, the Microsoft Cloud Service, uh, is freely available, as is everything else that I've described today. Uh, and you can just go ahead and use it by virtue of having a Windows Live ID. If you go to Layerscape, um, the front page of Layerscape, the home page, I should say, uh, has a bunch of featured communities and a bunch of featured content. And this would be a good place to start to go to sort of explore what's going on. You can see there's a listing of four different things here. The first three are tours. And the fourth one is a PowerPoint presentation. So if you click on Download Content, you get a PowerPoint presentation, which is a bunch of slides about how to use Worldwide Telescope. It takes about an hour to go through, and it walks you through generating a synthetic data set in Excel, exporting that to Worldwide Telescope, and then publishing it to Layerscape. So everything kind of fits together. And you can learn about how to do it. Uh, first of all, you can sort of get excited by going ahead and playing around with playing these different um, featured tours. And then you can start to learn through the tutorial. Okay. And when you go to a particular page, let's say Robotic Ocean Data Tour, so I clicked on that. It took me to a dedicated page. This one happens to have a video embedded of what the content looks like. So I can, instead of downloading it, I can just press play. Now, the good side about pressing play is I can just do it from my browser. But the bad side about pressing play is that I didn't have to install Worldwide Telescope to look at the content. And what we're hoping for is that Worldwide Telescope gets adopted. And so what we'd like is for people to actually have it installed and click on the blue button, View Tour. 
because View Tour will pull in the Worldwide Telescope file and play the tour back like we've been doing today. If I simply click on the play button, it'll just play the, the tour back as a video. Okay. So the very last thing, and I'm, I have 26 minutes, so I might actually finish a little bit early. Um, the very, very, very last thing is to talk about Worldwide Telescope from a computer programmer's point of view. And I mentioned earlier that that boils down to basically being able to do print statements that are in the right format. So Worldwide Telescope, when you have it up and running, is listening to a port on your computer, sort of like paying attention to a little text box. And if you print into that text box, then Worldwide Telescope will see that and it will try and gobble it up and parse it and turn it into actions that it takes. Okay? So I'd like to show, uh, briefly show how that happens um, uh, from a programmer's point of view. One of these days my mouse is going to show up. Okay, there it is. I was saying from a programmer's point of view, so here is a programming environment. Uh, this is called Visual Studio, and there's a free version online. Uh, this is developed by Microsoft, and it's uh, actually the free version online is called Visual Studio Express. Uh, it works just great. And it allows you to write programs. So the stuff that's in green there is, is code. It's uh, commented out, which is why it's green. Uh, and then the stuff in the other boxes is sort of support information around that. And this program it gets kind of long and involved because it's, it's sort of a Swiss army knife of programs. It does a lot of different things. Uh, but one of the things that it does, well, let me just build the program and show you what the program looks like. Let's see if it builds. Oh, it did build. I just didn't. Okay, so it builds and it runs. So this is what the program looks like. All my programs have a halt button here at the top because I usually want them to stop doing whatever they're doing. It's got all these little tabs here, and each one of these tabs is a different demonstration of talking to Worldwide Telescope, including this one here called Lat Long Lines. So if I bring up Worldwide Telescope, when last we left Worldwide Telescope, it was doing deedle deedle dee somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, way down there. But for this demonstration, I want to pull back. So here's my application. And it says, build some latitude and longitude lines that are gold, that are 100,000 meters above the surface of the Earth, or 1,000, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, every 10 degrees, and um, from negative 90 to 90 latitude and all the way around the longitude. So we just click on this button and it worked. And so I've now put the Earth in a little gold cage. Um, okay. And so what did that look like inside of the program? Let's see, I want to bring this back up. I'm going to stop the program good I guessed correctly right spiral generate lat long lines okay so when I click that button this little routine ran and First, it just gets a bunch of parameters. But the critical piece here that I wanted to point out is that there's one line of code here that creates a layer in Worldwide Telescope. And so without going into the details of you know, the exact format of this line, the point is that one line of code called fiducial layer, which is those, those, uh, that, that birdcage around the Earth that we just drew, is generated by calling this make earth layer and then I gave it a couple of arguments. I said it's going to be called lat long lines, that's the name of the layer, and then geometry color is the format of what I'm going to send you. So I'm going to send you a bunch of geometry and a bunch of color and the geometry is just the little individual line segments that make up that bird cage and the color is always gold. Okay? So that line of code right there created the layer in the earth and then there's some more code here that actually generates all of those little 
um, things. And you can see the word string shows up a lot. That's because we're creating a string, which is a computer science term for a bunch of text. And at the very end, that layer that we created at the beginning, we call a second time, and we say append all. And S is just the description of the birdcage, and it gets sent to that little window that Worldwide Telescope pays attention to, and Worldwide Telescope inhales all of that information, and it, and it prints the birdcage, the gold uh, framework around the Earth. So you say, well, that's, that's easy for you to say. Um, you know, it's easy for you to say because it's already been done and it, and it looks fairly straightforward. Um, but the, the point that I want to make here lastly is that uh, as a developer, when I get to write code, um, I don't like to have to go and do things over and over and over and over again. If I've already solved a problem once, I want that to be it. So that the next time I come back and I want to do something like this, I can use the solution from the previous time and not have to make it up again, for gosh sakes. So we've done that with the developer tools for talking to Worldwide Telescope. And so those are published. It's, it's open source code that you can go and get. The link to it is on that same web page that I keep referring to. And if you were to say, gosh, I'd like to write some code that talks to Worldwide Telescope, you can go and get this code. It's called Narwhal, like the whale that has the tusk. And you can use that code to simplify the process of talking to Worldwide Telescope and sending data in there. And so it's not, um, it's, I don't want to minimize what it takes to become a computer programmer. If you don't happen to have that skill set yet, it requires time and dedication. But uh, on the other hand, then you have the sort of capacity to go off and do stuff like this. And for me, it's very worthwhile. And uh, so I'd like to encourage you to sort of uh, open up that possibility if you haven't gotten there. And if you already are a developer, uh, then I would say that uh, this kind of environment is, is fun to play around with and it's uh, sitting there available for free. And so you have that option open to you. So um, to sort of wrap everything up, uh, what I've tried to show today is that uh, Microsoft Research is uh, very interested in uh, new frontiers in computer science technology. Uh, that we consider that to be something that happens not in an in a ivory tower or in a bubble, but actually in relationship to real world issues and real problems. Uh, I'm very, very lucky in my own view of things to be able to work in the piece of that that applies to environmental science. And so the problems that are attendant in environmental science to uh, developing technology that enables us to sort of understand this flood of data that we've created for ourselves is a complex and interesting set of problems. And what we want to be able to do then is to offer scientists and uh, students and researchers and government officials and everybody out to somebody who's wondering when to plant their crops uh, solutions that they can then use to, to not have to reinvent things all the time. And furthermore, to go way beyond that and to say the solutions that we're generating are stuff that you haven't even uh, imagined yet. And uh, if you think about them and see where that can take you, uh, it could take you much further down the road in what you're trying to ultimately accomplish. So um, that's kind of where we're coming from. And uh, in particular, we have this visualization engine, which I've been able to talk to you about. And then Drew will come in later, and he'll describe uh, the Cambridge tools, which will include distribution modeler, which you've already seen a little bit of in Fetch Climate. And uh, let's see, I think, that's, I think that's pretty much everything I'd like to say. So thank you very much. For, you've been very patient uh, through a lot of demos here. And uh, we have a couple minutes if, if we do want to do any questions, and we can bring up the lights whenever they can bring the light person to bear on the lights. So, but I can still see here. Thank you. Yeah. I see a couple of hands. Thanks. Uh, so, in Microsoft Office, when uh, you are uh, Porting an Excel file or an Excel sheet into Microsoft Word, for example, they are somehow linked so that if you change data in Microsoft Excel, you see the changes in Microsoft uh, Word also. Is it possible to do something like this in this uh, Word, uh, sorry, Excel to WWT? Yes. So the question is can, can you see changes in your data immediately? And that's one of the things I didn't mention this, but if you install the Excel add-in for Worldwide Telescope 
and you have connected a block of data to a layer in Worldwide Telescope and you make a change to the block of data in Excel, the Excel add-in will immediately notify Worldwide Telescope and it'll send that data and refresh it. So the two are connected together. I was having the rocky time with the demos or I would have shown that. But yeah, it's absolutely tied together. Yep. Hi. Thank you for the demonstration. Right mm -hmm. here. Yes. Okay. The question is that it seems that this software doing like climate matching mainly for species distribution models. It's doing more climate matching, yeah? So this software is, is generalized. I use it for um, looking at the paths, the migration, migratory paths of, of sharks. I use it for uh, atmospheric pressure. I use it for seismology. Uh, I use it for organic molecules. I use it for anything I can think of. It's a generic tool, but you're right that, that climate and the scale of the Earth is well adapted to visualization here. Yeah, and the m my main question is that when it tries to predict for other areas, uh, what kind of algorithm it uses? Like, for some model, they use maximum entropy, or for like GLM models, what kind of you know statistic is behind these right. predictions? Yeah. So the if your question is what kind of um, models are available, absolutely the best guy to ask that question of is Drew Purvis, who is our second speaker today. So he'll talk about not only climate models, but also global carbon models and ecological models. They have something called the Mattingly model, um, particularly that they've worked on, where they've sort of solved for the entire Earth's uh, carbon cycle. Anyway, so I'll just shut up and let you ask him. Please do ask him, because he's got some great stuff on that. Um, I have a question. When you look at the locations, let long, UTM, are there any uh, ways of actually working on map projections on the tool, or if you have to change anything? If you and also the other question is uh, the quality of the data of fetch climate. Is there a metadata? How, where did you get that type of data? Is that trim satellite or right, right. local meteorological yeah. stations and all that? Right. So fetch climate does have metadata. You can drill into the fetch climate data and find out where it came from. And there are some cases where there's overlapping data values. You can actually choose what source you want your data to come from. So, yeah, m m fetch climate is definitely more than just giving you a number. It's giving you a number and an uncertainty and a source so that you can work your way back into where did this data come from. And I'm sorry, your first, what was your first part? It was more on a, on a GIS oh, yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. What's the, so the, the basic Earth model here is some kind of spherical mercator, and that's the only projection that's, a, that's available in this virtual globe. Uh, there's another um, sort of, um, actually, there's another projective system called TOAST, which stands for something, but it's more uh, suited to working at the poles. Um, so it's like an equirectangular projection that gets draped around the Earth model. But that's about all I know about the, the Earth model at the moment. She's right here. I have a question to, um, concerning publishing the data. When you upload the data into the, um, the system, is, it then, is Microsoft then um, allowed to use the data? Or is it oh, really um, right. Because some so satellite data you are not allowed to. Right, right, data embargo. So the question is, if, if you upload your data into Worldwide Telescope, does that somehow become available to Microsoft? And you know, what's the guidelines, restrictions, and so forth? So first of all, when you uh, install a software, you have to you do the usual, I agree to the license thing, and you can read that thing. But you're installing it on your computer, and you can unplug from the internet and use Worldwide Telescope on your computer without ever uh, it connecting to anybody. And, and in any case, even if you were connected to uh, the outside world, your data would stay on your computer. It doesn't go to Microsoft. Microsoft has no interest in getting data from the, the application, but it's a very important question because you need to know, particularly if your data is, say, suitable for publication, you don't want it to end up in the wrong hands. Um, this led to us, when we built Layerscape, to create a, a system of uh, authentication, which is why you need a Windows Live ID, and you can actually embargo your data in Layerscape. So you can put it inside of a private folder that only you have access to, and then you can grant access to your colleagues so that you could collaborate in that folder, but no one else would never know it was there. So we're very, very serious about guarding your privacy rights around the, your data. 
uh, and we don't want to try and um, you know pull that kind of information. It's it's there as a platform for you to use. It's not for us to use. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else? Okay, good. Well, let's call that uh, good. I'm around uh, today and through the rest of this uh, workshop, so uh, please feel free to come and talk to me if you have any further questions, and, and thank you again. Mm -hmm.